and welcome everyone to our uh, Squirrel webinar tonight with the uh, Advanced Hunter Ed pro uh, program. My name is Lieutenant Sean Olagi. I'm with the department, department's Hunter Education program, and I'm the statewide coordinator for the Advanced Hunter Ed program, which unfortunately we have been doing just as webinars for the last year and a half, and uh, hope to resume in person sometime this next year, uh, hopefully sooner than later. Um, we are going to have two panelists tonight with us. We have um, environmental scientist Matt Meshry and we have uh, wildlife officer Andrew Walker. Uh, if you have any questions, please pose them in the question answer function at the bottom of your screen. If you hover over there with your uh, you know, mouse or your finger, I'm not sure what, uh, what you're viewing us with tonight, but you'll get the question answer box. Please pose your question there. Uh, there's also a chat function which you can use to, uh, you know, make some comments that uh, they have to be, you know, good comments. Otherwise, I'm going to mute you or kick you off of our program. So, don't make me do that. Uh, we have people in the background, our other panelists that are, that are with our program, that will be helping me answer questions that are posed, and uh, hopefully, we'll get a lot of things answered for you tonight. Also, I uh, wanted to let you know that uh, next week we will be covering California quail and not just the California quail, but California quail plural, the three varieties that we have and chucker. So feel free to join uh, and register for that topic next week. Um, well, it's next Thursday night. So anytime between now and then you can go on our advanced hunter education um, site and go to the coming uh, upcoming events and register for that. Um, I'm seeing some of the comments come in and thank you for, for all this. All right, so I'll, as you all know, I like to start with a poll and uh, the, you um, panelists will also be able to vote with this. I am going to start with uh, an experience. And also, uh, as you always know, if you've been following us, the second one isn't a question, it's mostly a joke, but we're gonna go ahead and launch that right now. So I'm looking for your experience. <clears throat> Please answer, have you ever hunted for tree squirrels? It's either a yes or no question. And the joke of this uh, section is, what did the father squirrel tell his family? A corny joke, a corny joke. All right, it's either funny or not funny. If it makes you smile, that's great. If not, um, sorry, maybe we'll get you on the next turnaround. All right. And I'm going to end the poll here. And here we go. So 55% of you answered yes, you have hunted for tree squirrels and 45% uh, have said no. And 89% found my joke funny, so thanks. Um, Here's the results, you can see them for yourself. If you're watching this in the recording, I'm sorry you can't see it, um, but you are listening to it and I am sharing the results with it. So we had 55% that said yes, they have hunted and 45% said no. All right, let's go to the next question. Interest, I wanna know why you're here tonight. Please choose two, okay? What are your main interest reasons for attending this webinar? Please choose two. Uh, one is to learn basic information on tree squirrels. The other one is hunting techniques for tree squirrels. Uh, third is to learn about game care cooking of tree squirrels. And if you choose other, uh, please put the reason for that in the chat so that we can address that while we're uh, in our webinar. And just be aware that some of the questions that you ask and the question and answer will be answered live. You may not receive a written response back from our staff. Uh, we will try and answer them live so everybody gets the results of that question. And then my joke was, how did the squirrel try to impress the, his date? He went out on a limb. <laughs> All right. You guys are liking that one. That's, that one's working. I'm going to end the poll in three, two, one and poll share my results so we have 51 percent of you that want to learn about uh, just basic information on tree squirrels 80 percent want to learn tech hunting techniques for tree squirrels uh 43 percent are interested in the game care cooking aspect and 11 percent put other 
So hopefully we'll figure those out. I see a couple here that uh, one's ask, asking where to go in SoCal. Unfortunately, there is nowhere you can go. It's not a legal hunt area, but Andrew will talk about that uh, later. And 90% of my joke, my jokes, there was a lot of squirrel jokes, let me tell you, but a lot of them had to do with uh, um, things I couldn't put on, on the air here. So we'll go, go, with, uh, go with that. Let me see. Follow up. Here's my last question. And I'm going to launch it. Will you go squirrel hunting before the season ends on January 30th of 2022? There's a yes, no, hope so. And the joke is, why did the squirrel bless when she had been hit by a car? Because she felt flattered. <clears throat> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Many of you probably have seen a tree squirrel or two in the road. If you haven't, you haven't been in the mountains because they are pretty, pretty susceptible to uh, uh, road, road, not road rage. What would be the word? Just uh, anyways, they get hit by cars. <laughs> All right, we're gonna finish in three, two, one. And 30% uh, say yes, you are gonna go hunting. 25% say no, and 45% hope so. Okay, well, hopefully after the end of this webinar, we give you any of those uh, barrier breakers that might prevent you from going, and hopefully we'll get you out there in the field. And only 77% like this joke. I, I didn't know. I was trying to find that third one. There was a couple, but uh, they, uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't sharing the results. Here you go. So that's what we have. Okay. Panel, this is what we have to deal with tonight. This is our crowd. We have um, 86 participants total. Thank you. Um, we have some questions and answers that are coming in. Appreciate that. Let me share my screen really quick so that we can get you on to our topic. All right. So tonight's uh, webinar is going to be talking about um, hunting California tree squirrels. So California is lucky enough to have uh, four varieties that qualify for hunting uh, tree squirrels here. Uh, we have the Western gray, which is uh, native or endemic to California. We have the Eastern gray, which was an introduced species. We have the Douglas tree squirrel or a pine squirrel, or sometimes known as a chicory. Uh, it's the one down there uh, with, with a little black bar along its belly. And we have the fox squirrel, the eastern fox, sometimes known as a red squirrel. Uh, those are the squirrels that are uh, qualify as tree squirrels that can be taken um, as game mammals here in California. Um, tonight, Matt Meshry is going to be joining us. He is an environmental scientist with our department. Uh, he has a, a master's degree from the University of uh, San Francisco State. And he's focused on ecology, animal behavior, and physiology. Um, he has presented with us earlier this year, um, giving us information on rabbits and hares. And he's rejoining us tonight. Thank you, Matt, for, for joining us. We thank also have, welcome. thank you. We also have CDFW wildlife officer, Andrew Walker. Um, Andrew has been with our department for 15 years, um, four years as a game warden in the Oakhurst District in Eastern Madera County. So if you're familiar with that area, you might have seen uh, Andrew out in the field. He likes to hunt pretty much everything that exists here in California. And as you can see here, there's a picture of him with a javelina from Arizona, his first javelina, I believe he said. And he likes to um, cook wild game meats, uh, tries to experiment with different recipes and util utilize all game uh, parts of game animals. Appreciate that, um, Andrew. So tonight we're gonna have talking points that are gonna be our uh, characteristics of tree squirrels. We're gonna talk about habitats and distributions, where they live. Uh, we're gonna talk about their activities. Are they active all day through the night and low light? What's, what are their activities? We're gonna talk about laws and regulations uh, for hunting tree squirrels, the tactics and equipment that you'll need to successfully do that and a little bit of care and cooking um, aspect uh, to tree squirrels. Andrew will tell, uh, argue probably to his uh, face turns blue that 
that uh, they're the best bird, uh, animals to eat out there. So that's our topics of discussion. Um, we're gonna try to address questions as they come in. Some of them may be answered live on the air and some of them may be uh, uh, answered at the end of our session. So what I'm gonna do is stop my share. I'm gonna allow Matt to take over and Matt's gonna discuss things for, we're gonna give Matt about 20 minutes to cover his, uh, his, his, um, his slides that he has presented for us tonight and then uh, Andrew will take over. So take it away, Matt. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, are you guys seeing my screen? Yep, we're seeing your screen. We just need to have it on the show. Yeah. Down, down there. Okay. Is yeah. that working? Yep. You're okay. In service. There we, there we go. Thank okay. you. Yep. Well, thank you guys. Uh, appreciate it. I, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the family uh, Styridae um, squirrels, tree squirrels. And uh, interesting, it's a, it's a Latin word, Styris, uh, derived from the Greek two words that, that together mean in the shadow of the tail or sits in the shadow of its tail. And the tail is really important for these guys. You can see that they use it also as a counterbalance uh, moving about in the trees, in their natural habitat. Go to the next slide there. Okay. So tree squirrels are uh, really uh, exceptionally involved for the task of finding and storing food. Um, and so they've got uh, just amazing, powerful, developed uh, musculature in their digits and in their arms, their abdomen for uh, climbing. Uh, if a squirrel were as big as you, it could jump a five-story building. So just amazing, powerful animals. Hard to believe they're mammals like we are, really. Um, four digits on the uh, forelimbs, but five on the rear, and you can see in that picture on the lower uh, left there that the, the hind foot can actually rotate around 180 degrees backwards to help squirrels forage in trees and to move around effectively. Um, just to back out a little bit, uh, kind of on the North American scale, uh, tree squirrels used to actually migrate to some extent with uh, the development of masts, uh, oaks primarily. Uh, the last of these we saw in 68 in Wisconsin uh, so it doesn't really happen anymore due to the fact that the forests aren't contiguous anymore and they, there just can't be those types of migrations. Uh, but there's crazy stories about people being overrun by these migrations, even on water and boats because squirrels can swim. Um, so after World War II, squirrels became popular again with, with hunters returning from the war. Um, populations had gotten pretty low and there were campaigns to reintroduce them to Parks across the country, they had been extirpated in a couple areas. Here in California, we're lucky we have uh, four game species today, uh, two native, two introduced. And I'll tell you a little bit about them and their habitats and how uh, we interact with that. They, uh, they also have uh, some other special adaptations, for instance, by Brisset are specialized hairs or whiskers, and they have these in a few key locations. Uh, so, and this helps them to move in really complex environments like the uh, treetops and in the understory. Um, they undergo a molt, usually uh, a full molt in the spring, and, a, and they'll, they'll molt again in the fall, but not the tail. Uh, the tail uh, is very important. They also use the tail hairs in their nests they build, uh, this is squirrels in general, tree squirrels in general, uh, two types of nests are, are what we call them drays. Uh, so a squirrel's nest is a dray. And the two types are generally just a simple platform and then a more complicated nest that might be for reproduction or cold. Um, our first species I wanna talk about is the Western gray. It's the native large species here. Um, strictly arboreal, so uh, they spend all their time in the trees. You'll see them on the ground occasionally, and usually they're foraging for uh, fungi when they're down on the ground. Um, they're diurnal, they're active during the day, but they're extremely shy of humans. 
you're not likely to spend much time before they uh, before they leave your presence. Um, the, you can see that the, the wonderful shading on the top matches that bark really well. And then below they have a, a white underside that'll blend in the sky if you're looking at them from below. And these squirrels only produce once a year, uh, relatively small litter, one to five kits. They have high survival, generally speaking, but low fecundity compared to other squirrels. So something to take note of. Um, their preferred food is, is acorns. These guys hide their acorns in multiple locations in the landscapes. We say that they're scatter hoarders. Their hoard is scattered about. Uh, I said that they forage for fungi on the forest floor and actually they, they don't forage on mushrooms per se, but more so on fungi in the ground that are associated with the tree roots. These are mycorrhizal fungi. And so they fill a really important role in moving these mycorrhizal fungi around and supporting forest health. Um, we learn more about this and trying to adapt forest management to maintain connectivity, not only of the patches, but also that canopy. And things like mistletoe are, are real important for nests for these gray squirrels. So maintaining a little mistletoe is something that we should do with forestry practices. Threats to the species include primarily habitat loss, and that's urbanization, agriculture, they're not tolerant of change to their environment or fragmentation. Uh, roadkill, Sean said, is, is a real uh, significant source of mortality for these guys. Unlike uh, the fox squirrels, gray squirrels don't use uh, power lines or phone lines to move around. So when the canopy is not contiguous, they'll come down to the ground and they, they are easily killed by cars. Uh, main, uh, we'll talk a little bit about mange. Of course, they have a full suite of predators. At the end there, we see uh, raccoons, opossums, and weasels, and those are primarily predators of the nest of these squirrels, but the usual suite of aerial and terrestrial predators. Um, <clears throat> so in California, we find the, the Western gray squirrel at up to 8,000 feet, and on the right side, I've shown you a graphic that we put together a couple of years back that is uh, overlay of the hunt zone for squirrels with uh, real simple three color, three level habitat suitability. And so the thing I wanna call your attention to, I get a lot of questions on this, is the Southern part of the state. And you can see that um, really there's only low quality habitat available in the Southern part of the state outside that hunt zone. There's some high quality habitat in the sky islands that exist down there. Uh, but it's, it's isolated high quality habitat. Um, you know, with introductions of the fox squirrel, which I'm gonna talk about, um, that zone was um, put in place to protect our native Western gray. And, and this squirrel is in the Northern part of its range actually threatened. Uh, and it's also species of concern in Oregon. Um, I mentioned that the, <laughs> Fox squirrel is a, is a bit of a, of a competitor uh, for our native. The fox squirrel is actually larger in its native range in the east. It, it doesn't get quite up to two and a half pounds here in the west. So it's sort of on par with the size of a gray squirrel. Um, they're a little lighter here in the west than they are in their uh, native habitat in the east. Um, and they build these two types of nests that are you know, real simple cooling platform or uh, in the cold months, a more, uh, you know, involved uh, birthing nest. Um, they also sleep rough, uh, which is a term used for this behavior that uh, all these tree squirrels exhibit, uh, not just fox squirrels. Um, you'll see them out there in the middle of the day doing this. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a resting. And they're also aware of, all, of everything that's going on. Uh, it, it saves energy and also is a thermal regulation tool. And some of these species that exist at higher elevations, you'll actually see this, do this on granite outcrops to cool off in the heat of the day. Um, if you watched my last talk, I was talking about jackrabbits. The jackrabbits are born furred uh, and with their eyes open, they can move around real within hours to days. Uh, whereas tree squirrels are described as altricial, 
from the Latin to nourish, meaning that they, they're born little pinkies and they, they require a lot of care for a lot, long time. Fox squirrels are strictly diurnal, uh, like the uh, Western gray, but unlike them, they're real tolerant of humans and they take advantage of a wide variety of food items. Uh, mostly solitary, but you see them together, especially when there's high quality food. They make a lot of weird sounds, clucks, barks, screeches, and uh, yell when you're when danger is approaching. Um, and these guys of all the tree squirrels, probably the biggest potential for uh, conflict with agriculture. They were introduced in the greater Los Angeles area and in the San Francisco Bay in the early 1900s. And on the right, you can see a uh, master's student thesis from 2004, where they mapped the progression of fox squirrels as they spread in the greater LA area. It's kind of interesting. Uh, but you can see that they're, they're tolerant of humans and uh, able to coexist in our urban environments if some basic needs are met. Where can you hunt them? Uh, it's a big squirrel. Where do you find these guys outside of the San Francisco and LA area? Well, they're in the valley. Um, you know, if you have access to private lands or, or fortunate enough to you know, happen upon them on public lands, um, they're also up and down the 80 corridor up into the mountains and in the foothills. This uh, <clears throat> map that I put up here on the right, I, uh, I found was a, a study where they took uh, re rehabilitation data, roadkill data, uh, West Nile data, and some public reporting to map these occurrences from 95 to 2015. Of course, you know, this is not comprehensive, but it, it gives you some inclination of, uh, you know, where, where they were detected uh, using those um, methods. Squirrels in general are, you know, they're quite intelligent. Um, Mikhail Delgado uh, from UC Berkeley in the last decade did a lot of work. Um, she was working with fox squirrels and looking at this question of, you know, what do they do with a food item when they come across it? And uh, there's some real complex cognitive uh, stuff that happens in that real short time when they find a food item. So there's, we describe this thing that they do as the 20 second roll and so you've seen this, squirrels find a, a nut and they're doing this with it and they're rolling around and they're looking and bobbing their head around. <clears throat> they do that for a while. And uh, the research that Delgado did shows that they're really assessing things like the perishability, uh, the, the value, fat value maybe, the, whether or not that shell is completely intact, uh, the best way to carry this thing. Also, uh, is anybody watching me? Because they do pay attention to that uh, for thinking about where they're gonna store their food. Um, and to uh, store and then find their food again, they use landmarks in the landscape. Uh, we think of visual landmarks, but they use both visual and smell landscape markers, uh, which is a tool, uh, a memory tool, like um, not dissimilar to the way that we would find you know, particular kitchen utensils by putting them together with others or plates with other plates in our kitchen. Um, like I said, they, uh, they use deception. So they're also assessing whether anybody's watching them when they're doing that 20 second roll. And you can see these, uh, we're moving now to the Eastern gray, uh, Cyrus carolinensis, uh, described from the Carolinas. Uh, these guys do it too, the 20 second roll here in Sacramento. We see them in all the city parks and at the Capitol now, uh, which is a sort of a recent phenomenon. We used to have a lot of fox squirrels around here in town. Uh, they've been seemingly uh, somewhat displaced, I think, by these Eastern grays now. And uh, we see some of these black morphs here in town. Um, some interesting work on that, that, you know, that can be a, a, a benefit in colder climates, uh, like some of their native range uh, in terms of heat loss and shivering, but uh, also probably susceptible to predators if you're black. So we see it a lot in cities because there's not too much predation here. Uh, these squirrels are described as crepuscular instead of uh, diurnal. So uh, instead of being active during the day, these guys are more likely to be active in the morning and evening. 
But, you know, I think that that probably describes their behavior in their native habitats here. I see them active all day. Um, and these guys, unlike the other squirrels that we talk about tonight, are scatter hoarders. So they'll have multiple stashes in the landscape. Um, uh, and remember, you know, where, where all those stashes are. Uh, they're also some of the best bird feeder uh, uh, problem solvers. And, and something to be aware of is that if you've got these guys around your bird feeder, there's probably a lot of nest predation going on with the birds that you're, uh, that you're wanting to see. Um, they, like I said, they were introduced in uh, the early 1900s. They actually uh, disappeared from the San Diego area. Uh, don't know how long ago that was, but um, uh, you can see on that, this uh, right side graphic is a master's student work from uh, the recent years where she used a, a Maxent model to um, take known occurrence data and project, you know, where, where would other suitable habitat be? So you see that habitat on that map there. <clears throat> and you can see that there's not that much suitable habitat like there is up here in the greater San Francisco Bay region. So that's probably something to do with why they didn't persist there. Uh, they are, they have real high reproductive uh, ability. Uh, they do, they can have two litters a year uh, with as high as eight kits in good habitat conditions. Um, and uh, interestingly, the female can attract a male from within a quarter mile radius during the several days that she's an estrus. I want to move to the very last species I'm going to talk about. And uh, this is the Douglas squirrel. Um, beautiful squirrel. You can see him on the right there, like have a orange creamy kind of chest with that little bit of a stripe, you know, between the belly and the, and the back fur. Um, John Muir wrote about this guy, a uh, whole chapter is about this guy. Love this guy. Um, surpassing every other species in the forest in force of its character, he said. Um, and that's kind of accurate if you've come across these guys. They, they see you coming or hear you before you hear them and, and they're on you like you, you got, you know, you gotta, you gotta pay them back or, or what. They're, they're, they're up and down the tree, uh, you know, flicking their tail at you. Um, John Muir said, a fiery sputtering little bolt of life, the wood's best juices. Um, so this chicory squirrel or pine squirrel, real vocal, Real fast, twitchy moving, and yeah, real fun squirrel. Uh, native to the Pacific Northwest, a lot of overlap with the uh, Western gray squirrel, but uh, ranges up to uh, 10,800 feet, so higher than the Western gray. Um, small squirrel, get up to about two thirds of a pound. And <clears throat> Their uh, preferred foods are, are white pines, uh, and also firs and spruce. They also eat uh, fungi, mushrooms. And um, these guys store their cash uh, in a single location. Uh, they're described as larder hoarders. And so over time, uh, generations of these squirrels use the same area uh, to, to cache their, their larder. And so in the left upper corner, you can see just a giant pile, maybe as tall as 15 feet of shelled uh, pine uh, scales. And underneath that whole thing is probably the current larder for the squirrels that are alive today in this lineage of generations of this uh, Douglas squirrel. This is a, when you come across a pile like that in the forest, you know, you're into some Good habitat for these guys. They have uh, pretty big home ranges for such a small animal. <clears throat> and they're territorial, like I said, they'll come and advertise their presence to you immediately. Um, they do well in uh, second growth uh, forest here in the West. And uh, they can mate up to uh, have two litters a year in California in these Southern parts of their range. Um, and these guys also be in higher elevation face predators like the American Martin, the goshawk and uh, other large owls. Last thing I wanted to touch on is uh, 
is nototeric mange. Um, this is a, a, a parasite and uh, pretty common actually in the United States, um, common here in California. Um, <clears throat> can be uh, pretty, uh, pretty bad for our Western gray squirrel um, and had, had, had some pretty big impacts recently in some of those isolated Southern populations. Uh, also, you know, they, they can fight this off. Typically squirrels, you know, do survive mange, but um, it lowers their fitness and it makes them more susceptible to other diseases. Uh, and so can be a, fa a factor in, in the health of populations. Uh, not really a concern for humans. We don't get mange. I mean, the mites could jump off of an infected animal. Um, you know, obviously I wanna inspect these guys. Um, and, and wear gloves on your hand and your game. Um, this is my dog, Maya, and uh, I got her about the time that I came to the department. And uh, we've done a, a bit of squirrel hunting and, and I'll put in a plug. If you've got a dog that'll stay at your side, uh, I've had some pretty good success with her uh, still hunting. And she's, it's really great to have her on the, to retrieve the squirrel. And so uh, that's, that's all the information I brought for you tonight, but um, take any questions you guys want. all right uh, what i'd like to do actually is probably address your questions there's some good ones and some more will probably come in uh, but i think we'll address those after andrew is uh done presenting so uh stand by matt we we have some good ones that came in and we'll some have to do with the the species and how we have some um go i'll let you take a look at them so you can prepare that's that's why i want to let you do that later all right and uh, go ahead and end your share, Matt, and we'll get uh, Andrew to start his. Um, okay. Actually, I'll do it for you. Okay. There you go. And Andrew, if you would, Matt, though, please look at those questions uh, that came in. Some of them were answered and some are still open um, that we can address later. All right. How's that? Is it on there? Yep, looks good. Thank you. All right, cool. All right, so we're going to go into some laws and regulations and uh, hunting tactics for squirrels. Um, I've hunted tree squirrels now for probably going on six, seven years now, and uh, they're becoming more and more intriguing for me lately. So Anyways, moving on. So we're talking about laws and regulations with, uh, relating to tree squirrel hunting. So tree squirrels actually are defined as resident small game. Um, so you have the Western gray tree squirrel, you have the Eastern fox squirrel, Eastern gray squirrels and the Douglas squirrels are all legal tree squirrels to take in California and are all under resident small game. And I, I say that for if you, want to look for regulations referring to tree squirrels uh, look under resident small game regulations and you can find most rules and regulations for that but we're going to go over that tonight that's just a good tidbit to, if you forget something or need to look or reference something you can start there um, so ones that you might typically come across but sometimes not flying squirrels right Typically don't see those, those are mostly nocturnal. Those are not legal to hunt, even though they are a tree squirrel. Um, so definitely, you, you probably won't run in those in the field since they're mostly out at night, but that is not a, a legal squirrel to take. Um, then you have ground squirrels on the right. Um, those are not tree squirrels, but those are also legal to take in California. So we go on to methods of take. So what kind of weapons used? Uh, that are legal for taking tree squirrels. Um, you got shotguns, of course. That's probably one of the most common ones. Um, 10 gauge or smaller. Um, the shotgun, if it has a, a magazine attached to it, um, has to be plugged. And then the plug must be of a one piece construction. Um, a lot of times I see people use a wooden dowel, uh, but something. Uh, that is a one piece construction inserted into the magazine of the gun, which makes it only hold two rounds in the magazine um, and one in the chamber. So a total of three 
rounds total in the gun. And it has to be uh, incapable of removal without disassembling the gun. Um, shotgun shells may not be used to possess or contain shot size larger than BB. Um, I typically don't run across that too much. Um, so no shot size is larger than BB, so everything's smaller. Um, muzzle loading shotguns is allowed as well. Falconry and also bow and arrow, so archery equipment. Um, and I actually get this question a lot too. Um, you can use any arrow um, you have, or you know, any field, a field point, a small game tip, a broadhead, etc. Um, the only thing you cannot use is anything that has an explosive tip or with any substance that would poison or tranquilize any animal. So no, uh, no poison darts or anything like that. Um, air rifles, the next one, um, powered by compressed air gas and used with any caliber pellet. Um, and then we have firearms, uh, firearm rifles and pistols, maybe used for taking rabbits um, and squirrels only. Um, that's also out of the resident small game section. Um, so rabbits and squirrels only, you can use rifles and pistols. Um, except in Los Angeles County, rifles and pistols may not be used. Um, we got crossbows. So crossbows is a legal method to take, except for the archery only tree, tree squirrel hunting season. Um, and if you have a disabled archer's permit, you can hunt with a crossbow during the archery only squirrel season. Um, and then dogs, as a uh, map shown in his last slide, maybe used to take inner you know, tree resident small game. I typically don't see that on the West Coast. Um, in the Midwest, that's very, very popular to uh, hunt squirrels with, with dogs. Um, so I'm going to these air rifles. Air rifles are becoming very popular now. Um, I'm seeing more and more of these in the field. Um, the couple picture or the picture I have here is a couple of them. Those are Air Force pellet guns. Those are both 25 caliber and they have uh, compressed CO2 tanks on them and they're very effective. They're also very expensive too. Okay, so now we're gonna go into the uh, tree squirrel hunting season. So the uh, general tree squirrel hunting season is the second Saturday in September. And that goes through the last Saturday in January. Um, there's also an archery only squirrel season and it, it's usually not very popular, um, but I do check a handful of archery squirrel hunters during that season. Um, and that is the first Saturday in August through the Friday preceding the second Saturday in September. So from the second Saturday, <coughs> excuse me, first Saturday in August um, through the second Saturday in September is archery only. Um, and then obviously the Friday preceding the second Saturday in September, the next day will be the opening day of the general season. So continue moving on here. And then shooting hours uh, for resident small games, shooting hours um, are one half hour before sunrise to one half hour after sunset. So 30 minutes before sunrise to 30 minutes after sunset. Small game mammals, mammals. Resident small game mammals, yes. Yeah, not birds, not, not, not quail. <laughs> not birds. <laughs> okay, then we have the open zones here for uh, tree squirrel hunting. Uh, I know Matt had that, the couple of maps up there, but. Here's where uh, your open zones are where you can hunt tree squirrels. So you have on the left, on the, excuse me, on the right hand side, you have the tree squirrel archery only and falconry only area um, shaded there in gray. Um, you can see most of those counties there. And then on the left, you have the general tree, hunt, uh, tree squirrel hunting zones uh, shaded in gray on that side. And you can see in Southern California on both of those, um, it is closed to squirrel hunting. And then all you need is a hunting license. Uh, no other stamps or validations, unlike, you know, upland game birds, or you know, upland game stamp or waterfowl, 
you know, you need a waterfowl, a California waterfowl stamp, federal stamp, you know, and then the har harvest information program. You don't need any of that with tree squirrels. You just need a hunting license. And then uh, common violations uh, I encounter in the field. Um, over limits is a, is a big one. Um, the daily bag limit for tree squirrels is four per day, four in possession. So that means no more than four squirrels in your possession at any time. Um, so your daily bag limit, so within a 24 hour period, so you're, in your day, your legal shooting hours during a day, four is your daily bag limit. And then if you hunt multiple days, you then have to eat your squirrels or go home and eat your squirrels and then head back out and then you can shoot another four if you want. Um, but if you go camping and you shoot a limit of squirrels, you shoot four squirrels and then you want to stay another day and hunt, you need to eat those squirrels. So no more than four at any time. You can eat one or two, but no more than four um, at any one time. Um, unplugged shotgun, I do come across that a lot. Um, hunter trespass, that's another one too. So if you're going to hunt uh, any land, private property, um, you must have permission from the landowner um, to hunt lands that are essentially it's enclosed by a fence, posted or cultivated. And the posted signs are a minimum of three signs to a mile and posted at all exterior boundaries. So unless you have written permission from the landowner, uh, you cannot hunt on a private property that has one of those three things. There we go, and from shooting from a public roadway. Um, so must be off the maintained portion of the roadway before you can shoot. So that means that if you're on a roadway open to the public, uh, public are free to drive up and down, say a forest service road, uh, county maintained road, um, I believe it's vehicle, uh, vehicle code 360 defines a highway. Um, you have to be off of that maintained portion of the road. So as long as you step off of it, you're legal to shoot. Um, and I, I come across this because as Matt was saying, roadkill is a pretty common mortality for squirrels driving down the road and see a tree squirrel run across the road. People get out of their car and just have a gun right there, boom, don't step off the roadway. Um, so that's one violation I come across. Uh, discharge a firearm at 150 yards of a dwelling or structure. Um, if you don't have permission to be on a property or if you are hunting public land and it borders private property, you still have to, and there's a house or a structure on that private property, you have to be 150 yards away from that structure, uh, dwelling structure, et cetera. Um, and that's a 150 yard boundary is a safety zone. I don't want people getting peppered, shot breaking windows, et cetera. Um, another one common too is a loaded long gun in a vehicle, uh, Fish and Game Code 2006A. So essentially what that says is uh, you cannot have an unexpected, unexpended live round in the chamber of your shotgun or rifle in a vehicle on or along a public roadway. Um, obviously that's a safety issue. Um, that's, that, that, one's a, that one's a big safety issue. Um, I, I do come across that one quite a bit. Uh, other things too, I, I come across the take of other game birds out of season. On um, the left there, that's a, a bantail pigeon case I made where a guy said he was squirrel hunting and he had uh, shot some pigeons out of season. Um, and then also taking non-game birds. So uh, I've had this happen too. You know, if you, if you don't see tree squirrels when you're out hunting and uh, you don't shoot whatever else is around without knowing you can. So uh, if it's not a legal animal, uh, don't shoot it. So now we're going to 
hunting tactics for tree squirrels. Um, like I said, I, I love hunting these things. They're a lot of fun and they're challenging and they taste good. Um, so essentially, as Matt was saying, uh, you want to, you know, find the food sources, right? Essentially with any hunting, any animal, um, look for food sources, um, find those habitats where these food sources exist. So, um, right, pine nuts, acorns, so you want for pine trees, oak trees, any of those edges. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see, um, you know, fresh sign of squirrels, pine cones that have had their nuts taken out and stripped away. You know, if you see that out in the woods, that's a good sign that, you know, you're, you're in the right area and that there's tree squirrels around. Um, finding acorns on the ground as well. You know, if you see that, you know there's going to be tree squirrels around. Um, so habitat and edges, right? So the oak woodlands. So you look for those, those edges. So you got the conifer oak edges. So chinkapin trees, large pine trees, um, cedars, the oak woodlands, anything like that. Um, great habitat for, for tree squirrels. They're, they're going to be in there. Um, essentially focus on elevations that have these edges, you know, the, the oak woodland, conifer edges, you know, stuff like that. Those are where you're going to find the most game animals, the most food. So anywhere from the 1,000, I put uh, 5,000 foot elevations. Um, in my area, in my experience, that's typically where I find the most squirrels that can be most productive. Um, so one of the, the, the most common, I think, uh, tactic is, uh, let's go back, is pretty much sit and wait. Um, and essentially, once you find those areas where you have good food sources and good habitat, um, you know, pick an area where you have large trees. I, I, I've been told by a lot of, of veteran squirrel hunters if you find those big pine trees and big oak trees where they come together, not small ones, but bigger ones, that's a good place to start. Um, and, and this tactic is very effective with binoculars too. You know, what you want to do is essentially, once you find that spot, sit and wait and look for movement. You know, you're looking for anything moving around in the canopies of the trees, you know, tree limbs, et cetera, um, coming off any kind of movement. And I just saw this today, uh, you know, I was over at one of my, my parents' house and I was in the backyard and I was staring up into a bunch of oak trees and mulberry trees. And I just happened to catch a tail flicker and that's all, boom, there, and there, there's one right there. And then you'll find them. And it's all about just catching that movement. So being that you have to sit and wait a long time, you know, bring a sitting pad, um, you know, that definitely helps being a little bit more comfortable. Um, turkey hunting vest with a seat, um, you know, it also works good as well. Um, times to focus on, on, on these guys, you know, first light in the evenings during the early season. So first, first couple hours in the morning, and the last couple of hours in the evening um, during the early squirrel season, if you're on an archery forum, you know, first couple hours and last couple hours. Um, you know, during the general squirrel season, um, you know, in the early season of the general squirrel season, you know, use that. Um, now, during the late, later on in the season, so you're talking, you know, fall, late fall, winter um, into January, you know, when the sun starts coming out and starts to warm up everything, you know, those squirrels are going to be more active. You know, they're going to be looking for food because it's nice for us. Um, so here, you know, a uh, a rifle can be a little more effective, you know, looking at those longer or those bigger trees are going to have longer shots, you know, so, you know, a 22 long rifle or a 22 mag or a 17 inch or more, something like that uh, can be effective for those longer shots. Um, but of course, too, right now you're shooting into up into the, the tree canopy. You want to be sure your trajectory, right? You want to know where our bullets going at all times. Um, if you're hunting private or uh, public land bordering private property and you're below and private property is somewhere up above you, you probably shouldn't take that shot. You should probably reassess. 
Um, yeah, shotguns too can be effective as well. Those long range choke tubes, either a, a Saturn Master or a Carlson, those, those are one of the most common choke tubes I find um, that people are using. Um, another good tactic too, if one squirrel comes out, be patient because another one might pop up. Um, I, I've talked to a lot of squirrel hunters and checked a lot of squirrel hunters. My area is, is uh, inundated with squirrel hunters. And uh, I always talk to them about that. And the most effective ones, that's what they tell me, is if you see one, shoot it, but then wait. There's going to be other ones coming out. Um, they're very, you know, family oriented. You have one here. They're not going to be too far away from each other. And uh, that seems to be what I was told one of the better effective or one of the better uh, tactics. Then another one, uh, still hunting, um, you know, still effective. And essentially what that is, is uh, walking slowly and methodically through the forest. Um, what you want to do is kind of walk through and you're in the squirrel area, you, you know there's food sources, you're in the right habitat. Um, you know, walk for a little bit, then maybe sit and post up by a tree. Uh, maybe sit for 10 minutes or so, maybe 15 minutes. Observe the tree canopy on the ground in front of you. Pretty much what you're doing is just, you're trying to catch movement. Um, you know, you see those squirrels moving, you got them. If they don't move, they're very hard to see. You know, those uh, typically the Western gray squirrels where, where I'm at up in the hills, uh, if they don't move, they're very hard to see. Um, so essentially, right, you're, you're watching tree limbs and you're watching branches for movement. You know, that tail flicker, that hop, you know, um, there's something to indicate movement. You can also listen too. you know, use all your senses, not only just your sight, but your hearing. Uh, if you hear bark, you know, crackling on a tree or, you know, a pine cone or something being ripped apart on a tree limb, you hear it, you know, dropping, you know, definitely try to key in on that area. So um, downside to still hunting though is, you know, you might bump game that you didn't want to and you might have a shot, you might not, you know, you might get one, they, they might get away. Um, but it is effective and it also breaks up the boredom of sitting for a long time. Your bottom starts getting numb, you wanna start moving around. So it definitely helps breaking up that boredom. Weather conditions to hunt, you know, hunt during the best weather conditions. So I mean best, I mean nice days, um, you know, clear, calm days, et cetera. You know, avoid those windy, stormy blizzard days. So pretty much like us, squirrels are not going to go out in those positions just as much as we're not going to go back, go out in those positions. Um, particularly this year, I've kind of noticed after storms when it's calm. So after a snowstorm, when the storm is pushed through and it clears up and it's cold and calm, as the sun starts coming up, this year is, has been particularly active for squirrels. Um, I've seen a lot of them out and about after our last couple of snowstorms we've had. Um, like I said, before snow snowstorms, after snowstorms, after you know rainstorms, um, etc. Nice, nice days. And squirrels stash their nuts in them for winter, so that's what you're looking for. That's why they're out and about. Uh, squirrel field care, um, skiing, gutting. Uh, you know, there's various methods. Everyone's got their own way of of, of doing these. Taking care. Um, you know, YouTube is a great source for these kind of things. Uh, you know, one that I particularly like for skinning a squirrel, which if you've never skinned a squirrel before, it can be tricky and kind of a pain because they're such a tough animal and tough little critter that their skin's very tough. And the one method I like is the YouTube video. You can look it up. It's how to skin a squirrel in one minute. And I think it's by Realtree Outdoors. That's correct. Uh, so that that's that's a good um, skinning video if you've never done one before. Um, so a knife will work good for skinning squirrels, uh, especially for that video. You know, if you want to do that method, if uh, you like, if you want to do it, 
a knife works good for the skinning aspect of it. Um, and once you get the skin off, um, game shears work best for the gutting, um, gutting part. And um, I use these, the Gerber game shears, and uh, I've used those for about five years now. And I think that's probably how I do all of my small game now um, is using those shears. Um, I start pretty much after I've got the skin off, I start on the uh, rib cage, cut around up to below the front shoulder, pretty much cut the rib cage completely out. And then once I've got that out, um, I can start trimming down the gut all the way down. And pretty much I don't even have to use my hand to go in and rip all these guts out and, you know, get all bloody and everything like that. Um, now, also, I quarter my squirrels. So you have two front shoulders, so I have two hind quarters, and what, what I call the saddle. Um, so it's the midsection uh, of the squirrel, so all along the back. Um, so that'd be the loins or the back straps. Um, go on, next one. And the last slide I got here is uh, uh, cooking techniques for squirrels. So I know Sean was saying, I, I preach about how good these things taste and they, you will be surprised. I've converted many people over to uh, eating squirrel. Um, I, the, the best way I can describe them, I think is they're very similar to the dark meat on chicken. So like the legs and thighs, um, as far as taste wise, um, many different ways to cook these things. Uh, two of my favorites are uh, frying and braising. So frying, you know, deep fried, shallow fried, um, coated with seasoned flour. It, you know, pick something. Take flour, put whatever spices you want in there. It, it doesn't really, you can put Montreal steak seasoning. You want to put a barbecue seed, just something, coat it. Um, another two, egg wash with breadcrumbs. Um, that one's really good too. And shallow frying on the right here, that picture, that's shallow frying. So usually in a pan, uh, Etc. What a skillet, wherever you want. A little bit of oil, whatever you want to put in there. Lard, uh, bacon grease, butter, oil, something like that. Just a little bit, and then uh, fry them till they're golden brown on both sides. Um, that's probably one of my favorite ways. Deep fried, you can do too. You it's just pretty much just dropping into either a deep fryer, um, or you can put a uh, saucepan or a pot on your stove. Fill it with oil, any kind of oil, preferably, you know, an oil with a high smoking point. So you either a, a peanut oil or canola oil um, and drop the whole tidbit inside and deep fry it. And then once you do that, uh, one of my favorite things too is uh, toss it with your favorite like chicken wing sauce. So like whatever, you get something from Buffalo Wild Wings or whatever and toss it in that. It's just like eating a chicken wing. Um, Another thing too uh, that I remembered is uh, air fry. Uh, the air fryer is becoming extremely popular nowadays. I haven't done a squirrel in it, but that would be a totally uh, great way to do a, a, a tree squirrel in the air fryer. You can you know coat it in the, se the seasoned flour or the breadcrumbs, whatever, but then throw it in there. Um, the second one, braised, braised in soups and stews. So essentially uh, what I mean by braised um, that means slow cooked in liquid for a long time. Um, so essentially, uh, you know, sear squirrel on both sides, pull it out, put vegetables in a pot. There, there's a, whatever, your favorite super stew recipe. Um, if you swap out, you know, your, your protein you normally use for your soup, super stew, put squirrel in it. I, I guarantee you're not going to be disappointed. Guaranteed. Um, the crock pot Dutch oven, great uh, pieces of equipment for braising. Um, yeah, anyways, there's there's a lot there. So yeah, that's pretty much all I got, Sean. You're muted, Sean. Yep, you're muted, Sean. I had to mute myself. Sorry about that, because uh, somebody was trying to cook dinner downstairs and made the smoke detector go off. So uh, I hope that's not a sign of what my dinner is going to look like, but we'll see. 
All right. So a lot of good questions came in. One that I meant to answer and said, I, I pressed the wrong button. It said answer live. Um, Mike, you had a question about using archery equipment, how far from a dwelling? Uh, can you be less than 150 yards? No, um, archery equipment has the same, um, has the same uh, technicality uh, for the 150 yards. So make sure you have um, permission to be within that 150 yards of an occupied dwelling. Okay, right, Andrew? Right, exactly. Uh, um, somebody was asking if you can use air rifles to take pigeons. I believe that is a no because that's a migratory bird and it requires you to use uh, shotguns. Right, yeah, band-tailed pigeons are migratory game birds, so it's the yeah. same method to take as dove, uh, or duck. Wa duck, waterfowl. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, somebody was saying, uh, let me see, let me go back to some of the other ones. Uh, Matt, did you have a chance to see some of those questions earlier um, presented? Yeah, I was looking through the chat. I mean, I see uh, some interest in... Southern California hunting and some interest yeah. in, in more liberal uh, bag limits. Yeah, yeah, I, I uh, you know, those are tough ones. Uh, Nat's not going to be in charge of this, uh, making this happen. It's mostly a regulatory question that has to be posed to the um, Fish and Game Commission to accept changes to that regulations. But some of the questions are valid, um, asking about why, uh, if some of the species are, are non-native to California, why isn't there a season that's more liberal for them? And I could tell you the Eastern squirrel, I could see where why we couldn't, maybe the similarities of the two species, uh, people wouldn't be able to de you know, detect what they are, but I could see maybe for red, uh, the fox squirrel, that maybe that could have a possibility. Is that something maybe, Matt? Yeah, I mean, uh... I would say it's a possibility, but, you know, I would go back and think about our discussion that, uh, you know, that these guys as game species had really come back from nothing and had been extirpated in a lot of areas and reintroduced. Um, you know, there was a lot of concern about our squirrel in Southern California. And when you think about opening up more opportunity for fox squirrels, Realistically, there's not a lot of areas that we're talking about that would be additional opportunity. Uh, you know, um, Fox, it, it, it wouldn't do anything for the problems that I see in the, in the chat in terms of, uh, you know, nuisance issues. It wouldn't do anything for nuisance issues in those areas. We just can't hunt in those areas. Mm -hmm. So... You know, it's, it's it's sure. You know, I, I agree as a, a introduced species, uh, but but then the opportunity side of it. Think about that. I mean, there's not as much opportunity for squirrels probably as all of us would like, and so you know, there's that aspect of spreading it around too. You know, uh, some another question that and um and uh, I don't know if you saw the wild uh, one related to wildfires and population. Not you know, was there. A, um, what's, what's the outcome of that on our population and, and their habitats for that? I mean, is it looking, you know, are there animals still in those areas that could possibly rebound or uh, when's it going to be looked at? You know, um, how, how are those things possibly going to happen? Yeah, you know, with fire, I mean, <clears throat> obviously these guys in our forests are adapted to fire, but uh, with catastrophic fire, uh, you know, something that we haven't seen, so we're, we're seeing as we go. I mean, my, my expectation is that, you know, squirrels are going to recover in those areas. Um, you know, certainly depressed populations in, in those areas at the moment, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, panel, did you guys see any other questions that um, we need to go ahead and address that, Robert, maybe, that... Uh, we should go live with. Uh, I lost track of them when they got switched to the answered section. Um, yeah, bubonic plague and squirrels. Yeah, you want to cover that, Matt? I, I know uh, we were talking about that when we were doing our dry run, yeah. and I think that was more maybe prevalent or existed more with ground squirrels, not really tree squirrels. Yeah, it's certainly a lot more prevalent with, with ground squirrels. You know, fleas are the 
primary vector for plague. And um, so these, these, these species that are more social, tree, you know, tree squirrels are not considered social um, like ground squirrels are. Uh, they're certainly susceptible. And so, you know, in areas where you have high density or for whatever reason you get a, you know, an instance of infection of plague, it's, it is possible. And, um, you know, it's probably not something that we detect in a lot of instances. And, and then I saw, I've seen a lot of questions uh, regarding lead free versus non lead free. Um, in what cases, Andrew, can people use uh, lead free ammunition, uh, non lead or actually lead ammunition? I only know of one. For, for squirrels. Well, for squirrels, the only, well, hunting in California, period, you have to use non lead ammunition. Mm -hmm. The only, even depredation, you still have to, any legal method to take. So authorized legal method to take, you have to use non-lead. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any. Except I can, for, I can think of one. Except I can think for, of one. Yeah. Oh, oh, Pella rifles, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Pella rifles, we yeah. Got this was Stump the Warden uh, by, no, we, we did fine. So yeah, you can you can use the one exception for uh, lead-free ammunition, which there are lead-free options for pellet rifles, um, but with pellet rifles, you can use lead pellets, but there are, if you want to, you can use lead-free. There are options for that out there. All right. Um, same thing for 22. Somebody asked about 22s and 17s. Any of the rimfire cartridges, there are lead-free options out there. They may be hard to come by at this time, uh, like all ammo is, but uh, there are lead-free options for those uh, calibers. Um, somebody asked for the pure white ones I see in Shasta County, Western Gray. Um, did you say there was a, a white phase of a uh, Eastern, um, Matt? A white and black? Yeah, I mean, the Eastern's the, yeah, the, they, they, it's common in Eastern uh, squir uh, gray squirrels. Um, Probably also occurs in our in our western. It sounds like up in Shasta, that's going to be that's going to be a western gray. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another thing that we want to let people know, and, and Andrew kind of hit on this, is the only thing you need for squirrel hunting is basically a means of take and a license. You don't have to have any validations or special stamps. It's a fairly long season, starting as he mentioned, the second weekend of September and going through the end of January. So it's fairly long. I know some Eastern states have longer seasons, uh, but you know, for California, as far as seasons go, I think that's one of the longest as far as the general season is concerned, besides maybe rabbits, cottontail being a longer one. Um, but you know, getting out there into the forest and having opportunity to go harvest some, some game and, and just explore, um, get out there and do it for squirrels. Um, dog training seasons for squirrel. I don't know if we have any of that. That's uh, something somebody's asking. Tell when, how will you tell when they're sick? A lot of times you can look at the livers of animals to see how healthy it is. If it's just a bright red, you know you have a healthy animal. If it's spotted or any type of uh, uh, skin disease. Um, Matt mentioned mange. But if you remove the, the, the skin and you don't see any lesions or any type of things that are out there, then uh, you can probably consider the animal healthy looking at the liver, right, Matt? Or do you have anything to add to that? No, yeah, there's not as many concerns with squirrels. I mean, there's not anything that squirrels carry that's gonna be harmful to humans. Um, you know, they carry some viruses that are harmful to other squirrels, but not, not here in the West so much. Um, just a healthy animal, you know. Okay. Uh, any other questions we should address, panel? I want to see how my dinner looks out there tonight. Hopefully my son's cooking me some steaks and uh, hopefully they're not burnt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank you, everyone for joining us tonight. We uh, had a great crowd. If you have any questions that didn't get answered tonight, please feel free to email me. I will be sending you an email uh, links uh, with, with squirrel hunting links. One of those links will be talking about some recipes for squirrel. 
uh, how to clean them, how to care for them. As uh, Andrew mentioned, there is a like less than a minute method. It looked fairly simple to do and execute, and uh, it looked very clean the way it worked. So um, let's get out there and go squirrel hunting. If you have any success after this webinar, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, take a picture. Uh, we love to have reports of how our um, Advanced Hunter Ed webinar attendees are doing out there in the field. So thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Matt, for coming on board. If you have any questions, again, out there, uh, you want to address to me, you can send it to my advanced, uh, my email address, which is on our Advanced Hunter Education page, and uh, reach out and ask those questions. I'm here to help break down the barriers to you entering in the field. So thanks again, panel. And uh, for then, good night. Uh, Merry Christmas to all and Happy New Year. I will see some of you hopefully again next week when we talk about California's quails or quail and the uh, red-legged partridge, also known as the chucker. All right. Good night. Good night, Merry Christmas.